Okay, let's try that again with sound. It helps if I unmute my mic, doesn't it? Yeah, I got it. Uh, to see some messages come through saying no sound. And uh, my wife comes in and tells me no sound. So let's do that again. Um, you know, I am. Thank you, Lisa, for reading lips. Um, aren't you glad I don't have a mask on here at home? Make it hard to read lips. Okay, so now the sound is coming through. Let me try that again, uh, because if you didn't read my lips or if you didn't read it very well, I'll just go ahead and repeat all of that. Tonight we've got Revelation chapter 20. I'm turning a little red because I'm embarrassed. Uh, tonight we've got Revelation chapter 20. Um, this is the second to the last class. We're going to finish up the class on Revelation on Wednesday evening. Next Sunday, we start our new quarter at North Beach. And so if you are a member at Beach and you signed up for uh, the class on Amazing Grace or the, the other class that I can't remember right now off the top of my head, but the, the, the class taught either by Phil Lumpkin or by David Parks, those classes are going to be on Zoom. And so if you signed up for that, you'll get the information from those teachers about the Zoom classes. If you signed up for Isaiah, it's going to be right here on Facebook Live. And so we're going to continue the same format, same time slots, 5 p.m. on Sunday, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays on the book of Isaiah. If you are not a member at North Beach and you would like to continue uh, joining us in on these Facebook classes, I do hope that you will do that. You are most definitely welcome. If you're kind of interested in doing a different Bible class, you'd like some information on those Zoom classes, send me a message here on Facebook Live. If you send it to the church uh, right there where we're at right now, that message will come to me directly and say, hey, uh, I'd like to have a Bible class starting next Sunday, but I'm not real interested in Isaiah or I'm not real interested in the Facebook format. Send me that and I will make sure that you get some information about the other classes that we're going to have. Um, we're going to be doing this for the foreseeable future. And so uh, I think it would be great, whichever class you choose to go to, that you uh, have the opportunity and take the opportunity to study God's word. All right. Having said all of that, I've spent, I've wasted a certain amount of time because I didn't have my mic unmuted. And so we're just going to go ahead. I'm going to turn off the video. We're going to get right into the class. I will say again that I've got my iPad here right next to me. And so if you've got some questions or comments that you'd like to make, just post those into the comment section and I'll be looking down there. I actually catch that movement out of the corner of my eye. I'll be looking down there and we'll see those comments and questions and I will try to address those in the class. Book of Revelation chapter 20 this evening. Let's just go ahead and pull up our roadmap that we have looked at over and over through this study that we started basically three months ago to kind of uh, remind ourselves and see where we are in the book of Revelation. Remember again, the book of Revelation divides very neatly into two halves. There is the first half of the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 11. There is the second half of the book of Revelation, chapters 12 through 22. Both halves of the book of Revelation tell the exact same story. Okay. The only difference is that the first half of the book tells it from the earthly perspective, if you will. The second half of the book tells the same story again, but from the standpoint of the deeper spiritual background, a kind of pulling back of the curtain so we can see what's going on behind the scenes. Remember, the book of Revelation is written to Christians who are living in uh, Asia Minor. At the end of the first century, they are being persecuted for the cause of Christ. They are facing the loss of their property. They're facing the loss of their jobs. They are at times facing the loss of their lives. They are being persecuted executed. They're questioning why all this is happening and what's going on. The book of Revelation answers that question. It reassures these Christians that regardless of what they see going on around them, victory is in Christ and they need to remain faithful to Jesus. They need to remain faithful to God so that they will be victorious with him. And so the first half of the book talks about things that are going on on the earth. Certainly there are spiritual things into consideration there, but it's talking about it from the perspective of what people are seeing. You get to the second half of the book and what's happening in the second half of the book is now the curtain is drawn back so the people are able to see that behind the Roman Empire, behind the Roman soldiers that are carrying out the executions, behind the Roman emperor that is persecuting God's people is Satan himself, okay? And so they're seeing that what's going on is that they are part of this universal cosmic battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And again, the emphasis is on 
being on God's side, regardless of how things look. And so that's how the book is laid out. Tonight, we are still in this chapter 19, uh, really all the way to the end of the book, where we have a discussion of the complete and final victory of the church. And very specifically this evening, one of the big topics that we're going to look at tonight is the thousand years and Satan being bound and what is that all about? Now, chapter 20 is one of those chapters in the book of Revelation that particularly finds itself attractive to a lot of folks who are of the premillennial uh, way of thinking about Jesus's return. And so a lot of their doctrines and teachings come out of these chapters. I will emphasize again that when we are trying to understand the book of Revelation, we must understand it in such a way that it would have made sense to the people who were originally getting the book. And so if we're uh, coming up with all sorts of fanciful interpretations of the book of Revelation that people in the first century could not possibly have understood and would not possibly have had relevance to them, then our understanding of the book of Revelation or that understanding of the book of Revelation, I would suggest to you is flawed. So we need to understand Revelation in the immediate context written to the people who received it. And from that, then we can draw lessons that are valid for us today. All right, having said all that, let's go ahead and get into Revelation chapter 20 itself. Believe it or not, only 15 verses, but there's a lot of material to cover. Let's start off by reading verses one through six, where we have the binding of Satan. Then I saw an angel, this is Revelation chapter 20, verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge were, was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about in these six verses, because we've got this discussion of the thousand years, we've got this discussion of a first resurrection and a second resurrection, we've got the second death as well. What in the world is going on in these verses? All right, let's try to understand this together. The first thing that we need to understand when we come to this idea of Satan being bound is that we need to understand that from a biblical standpoint, Satan has been bound or limited, if you will, in more than one way, okay? So it's not just a that there's just one way in which Satan is bound and that's the only way that he's been limited. He's been limited in more than one way. So for example, when Jesus died and was raised, Satan's power over sin and death was destroyed. That's a binding of Satan. That's a limiting of Satan. If you'll take your Bibles, just hold your spot there in Revelation chapter 20. If you'll take your Bibles and go with me over to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, let's look together at verses 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. This is what we read. This is what the writer writes. He says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. This is talking about Jesus. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to to lifelong slavery. So here we have in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 this discussion of Jesus and the death that he died and that through that death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. The text tells us plainly that's the devil. 
But notice with me, if you will, that very clearly the devil has not been completely destroyed when Jesus died on the cross. The devil is still very much active. He was active in the days of the book of Revelation. But what happened when Jesus died on the cross and was subsequently raised was that Satan's power was limited. And very specifically, his power over sin and death was destroyed. Because at this point in time, when Jesus, is, when Jesus dies on the cross, a way of salvation is made open. People can be forgiven of those sins. And so in that sense, Satan's power has been destroyed. It's, it's a very strong limiting, if you will, because at least in regards to this, that power has been taken away from him. He no longer has that power, okay, because of what Jesus did. That's one way in which Satan has been bound. Another way in which Satan has been bound is what we see here in Revelation chapter 20. He's been bound when he failed to destroy the church using Rome as his instrument. Rome didn't realize they were being used as the instrument of, of Satan, but that's exactly what they were. It is Satan who's, who is going after the church, and he is using Rome, the city and the empire, in order, to, in order to carry that out. But he fails in that regard. That's the message of Revelation, is that Rome will not succeed. In the end of all of that, Rome will pass away, that empire will pass away, that persecuting power will pass away, but Christ's church will still stand. So in that regard, he's also bound. In Revelation chapter 19, we see the beast and the false prophet and their minions judged. And then in Revelation chapter 20, Satan is bound. So we need to understand that this limiting of Satan, there's been more than one way in which that has happened. It's happened through the death of Jesus. It's also happened in regards to how he was persecuting the church in the days of John, in this the time when this book was written. We also need to understand something here about the thousand years because it's the period of his binding. The thousand years, of course, remember we talked about this at the beginning of the book of Revelation, beginning of the study, that we need to be very, very careful how we use numbers. That if we come to the book of Revelation and we expect the numbers to predominantly have their literal sense, we're gonna make we're gonna make a mess out of the book of Revelation because that's not how apocalypse apocalyptic literature worked and the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. So we have the thousand years. It is not a mathematical quantity. Instead, what the thousand years represents is a complete as in full and whole period of time. So we get numbers like 10, okay? 10 times 10 times 10 is a thousand. 10 is that number of perfection. Remember, we talked about this. You have 10 fingers, you have 10 toes. That's how many you're supposed to have. If you're born with 11 fingers, doctors will know there's a problem. If you're born with nine toes, doctors will know there is a problem. So we count fingers and we count toes. We still do that with babies when they're born. We count and make sure, really got 10 fingers, really got 10 toes. That's important. So 10 has this idea of completion wholeness. It's multiplied by itself and multiplied by itself again. And so the, the number thousand came to represent that which was complete. And so the thousand years represents a complete period of time. It begins, I would suggest to you, with the great supper of the Lord. We read about that in Revelation chapter 19. Let's just go in our Bibles. You should, let's see, you're, you're probably in Hebrews. Let's go back to Revelation. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 19 and look with me, if you will, at verses 17 down through 21. Revelation chapter 19, 17 starting, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. With a loud voice he, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God. We talked about this Wednesday night. To eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And then verse 21, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So we talked about the great supper of the Lord, which represents that judgment on Rome, on the city and the empire that had been persecuting God's people. And it is pictured here as an utter and total defeat. That's when Satan 
is bound. That's when the thousand years begins. Well, how long is the thousand years gonna last? If it's not a mathematical formula, then we can't take some date back in ancient history, count a thousand years out and say, well, that's the end, that's when it ended. No, it's not that kind of a number. It's representing that complete period of time. So when is it going to end? Lots of people will spend a lot of time writing this, that, and the other thing and saying this is when it's going to end. It's going to end in 1914. It's going to end in 1918. It's going to end in 20, uh, 2020. I tell you what, if somebody said that, a lot of people might believe them this year that it's going to end. But the truth of the matter is only God knows when that period is going to end. I want to emphasize that again. We see in the book of Revelation when it begins, the book of Revelation though doesn't tell us when it's going to end. Only God knows that information. So we may very well, we may very well still be in the thousand years, or maybe we're not. We'll come to that in just a moment and talk about it as we get towards the end of the class. Let's look on. We're still in these first six verses. Notice with me, if you will, that in these verses that we read, there are two resurrections. You may have noticed that as we were reading through the text. Two resurrections that are under consideration here. The first of those resurrections the first of those resurrections, if I can pull that point up, the first of those resurrections represents those who had died for the cause of Christ, those who had not worshipped the beast. And so when they are raised, it is the resurrection of Christ's church out of Roman persecution. I would throw in here and note in regards to this a text that is found in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel. We're going to take the time to read this. It's uh, one of those well-known passages in the book. You may already know where we're going. Ezekiel chapter 37. We give you time to find that so you can follow along with me. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 1 is where we're starting to read. Ezekiel chapter 37, find in your Old Testaments, the book of Ezekiel chapter 37, starting in verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, Behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. I will place you in your own land and then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is a very famous passage in the book of Ezekiel. It's a passage even that became a, a, uh, a, a Negro spiritual that was sung in years past. You may know the song. I think it's Dim Bones and it's coming straight out of that text. Well, what in the world is Ezekiel 37 talking about? It is, a, it is talking about the resurrection of the nation of Israel out of Babylonian captivity. So these folks had been carried into Babylon, Babylonian captivity and for them it was like being in the grave. They are dead. God said, I will make you live again and I will bring you out of that grave, out of those graves and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Resurrection, resurrection in the scriptures is not always the resurrection 
at the end of time. We need to remember that. And so when we get to Revelation chapter 20, we have this first resurrection. Those who had died for the cause of Christ, it is virtually the same as what we find in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 is talking about a physical nation that's going to be brought back from captivity. Revelation chapter 20 is talking about a spiritual nation that has been beaten down, that is going to be raised out of that. And so the Roman emperor is gone. The Roman empire is gone. Christ's church still stands. Rome and Satan who stood behind it could not utterly destroy the church because the church is God's people and God would not allow that to happen. So the first resurrection, those who had died for the cause of Christ. What about, what about the second resurrection? The second resurrection takes place at the end of the thousand years. And I would suggest to you that that is the loosing of Satan. Satan has been bound for a thousand years, but at the end of that time, he's going to be loose. He's going to be let loose. The chain's going to be taken off, if you will. I would suggest to you that, what's that what that is talking about is a resurrection of Satan's cause to destroy the church. What we must not do is we must not come to the book of Revelation and say, see, Rome tried to destroy the church. They were unsuccessful. Satan will never try that again. I would suggest to you that quite the opposite. What the book of Revelation is telling us is that there will come a time when Satan will do that again. He will use some other instrument. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But he is not done. And in God's plan for what he's allowing to happen, Satan has a role yet to play. And that role is going to be he's going to come once again against God's people. All right, let's continue on in the book of Revelation. Let's look now at verses 7 through 10, and we'll talk about that loosening of Satan. So Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, so we have this discussion here in verses 7 through 10 of the loosening of Satan. It is the last great effort before the final judgment. And we see a couple of, uh, couple of characters that are introduced here in the text, Gog and Magog. Now, what's interesting about this is that we read about Gog and we read about Magog back in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 38. So go ahead and take your Bibles and go back to Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. And let's read some things that are here. Revelation, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 38. And remember, chapter 37 was where we had the vision of the dry bones that we just talked about. Now in chapter 38 here in the book of Ezekiel, we read about another attack against God's people. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog. Now notice here in, Ze in Ezekiel, uh, Gog is an individual. Magog is the land that he comes from, okay? That's a little bit different than what we have in Revelation. The chief prince of Meshech and Tubal and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Beth to Gomar, and from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled before you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter days you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God on that day, 
Thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates to see spoil and carry off plunder to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth. Now we could keep going on here in the text. We don't have time this evening to read all of chapter 38 and all of chapter 39, but it is on the heels of the vision of 37 that concerns the restoration of Israel, that there's going to be this attack. Revelation, Revelation tells us that this is happening sometime before the final judgment when Satan is going to loose him is going to be loosed and he's going to once again go after God's people we understand that the restored Israel is a literal restoration in the Old Testament but it's also a symbolic restoration because Old Testament Israel faithful Israel then becomes conjoined with the idea of the church in the new and so in Revelation talking about this last great effort of Satan using the nations to go against God's people again, it's going to happen right before the final judgment. Now, I would add in this, and we're not going to read this reference, but I would add in regards to this, you also might look at Zechariah chapter 14 and see how that compares to what we've seen in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and what we've seen in Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation, in the book of Revelation, Gog and Magog symbolize all the forces that Satan will use. Well, who's Satan going to use? when he's loosed again? I don't know because the text doesn't tell us. Certainly he could be using nations, but he also might be using isms, if you will, atheism and humanism and materialism. And maybe there are some other isms out there that Satan will use. Maybe it will be a political force. Maybe it will be the forces of atheism and humanism. But God, uh, Satan will use whatever forces that he can in order to wage war once again against God's people. But, but this last effort will meet the same end as when Satan used Rome. Satan tried to defeat the church using Rome. It didn't work. Whatever Satan is going to use towards the end of time, it won't work either. Whether he's using an, an ism, whether he's using atheism or humanism, whether he's using a political power, it isn't going to matter. Satan's not going to win. Victory is in Christ. And in the end, in the end, Satan is going to join the beast and the false prophet in the lake of fire. So he's loosed. He wages war again. He's going to be defeated and he's going to be judged. Well, that then gets us to the last part of the chapter, and that's verses 11 through 15. So let's go back to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. I know we've been jumping around a lot from Old Testament to New Testament. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 20, and let's start reading in verse 11. Then I saw, this is Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we see there what happens with Satan up until verse 10. He's loosed and he's defeated. Now there's the final judgment. Now all mankind are going to stand before the judgment seat of God and they're going to answer for how they lived. This is the final resurrection. This resurrection should not be confused with the revelation, uh, with the resurrection, I'm sorry, of Revelation chapter 20. I know it gets a little confusing when we have these different resurrections being talked about. We just need to be careful in how we read the text and what we see going on there. There's more than one revelation, in, uh, more than one resurrection, I should say, in view. This is the final resurrection. This is the resurrection of everybody. Everybody now is going to be raised. They're going to stand before Christ in judgment. They're going to stand before God in judgment. Death, 
Hades and those not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. And the text tells us very plainly that the lake of fire is the second death. So how does it end? How does it end for Satan? How does it end for those who have followed him? How does it end for those who are not written in the book of life because they have not obeyed the gospel of Christ? It ends in the lake of fire, that second death. All right, I've got a chart that I want to pull up to try to, I like charts. I like to put things out graphically when I can. So just a little chart to kind of see what's going on, an overall time uh, view, if you would, of what's going on here in Revelation and in the Bible as a whole, in the New Testament as a whole. So if you have uh, in your mind, and if I had a pointer here, I would point that out to you. But if you look up there uh, on the, if you look on the left side, you have Jesus on the cross. It's the death of Christ, the death. And I would throw in there the resurrection. All of that's linked together. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the day of Pentecost following, the church is established. About 70, 60 years after that, begins the period of Roman persecution. So notice with me, if you will, that first section there with the red marking Roman persecutions, okay? It's gonna begin uh, in, a, in an empire-wide way during the days of John, during the days that Revelation is written. It's going to continue off and on for the next couple of hundred years. God is going to judge Rome. We have the Battle of Armageddon where, where the enemies of the church are defeated. That begins the thousand year period. During that period, Satan is bound and the saints reign with Christ. It's going to last a thousand years. Remember, that's symbolic. It's a complete and perfect period. At the end of that thousand years, Satan is going to be loosed. He is going to once again wage war on God's people. And then after a certain amount of time, which I would gather from the text of Revelation will be relatively brief. It's all going to end. Satan is going to be defeated and there's going to be judgment and eternity begins. So the question, the question becomes, and this is the question a lot of people ask, and you may be thinking of it as well as you're looking at that chart. When is Satan loosed? Well, first of all, we've already said this, only the Lord knows. We have no earthly idea. And to try to put some kind of date on that, to try to say that it's in 1918 or 1914 or 2020 or 1945 is completely, completely misguided because the scriptures don't tell us that. We don't know when that's going to happen. Only the Lord knows. Whenever it happens, though, this is what's important. Saints are assured of victory. Years ago, years ago, when I taught the book of Revelation or when I, asked, when I was asked the question about the thousand years, I would usually answer that to say, we are living in the thousand years now. I've really had to modify that based on my study of the book of Revelation, because the truth of the matter is, I don't really know if we're living in the thousand year period. We may very well be living in the period where Satan has been loosed and he is once again waging war against the church. I just don't know. But I know that once that happens, once he's loosed, if he hasn't already been loosed, he's going to wage war for a while, but he's going to be defeated because God is going to come in judgment. And that's the final judgment, the final resurrection, the final judgment. And after that, eternity is going to begin. And what's important for us here in studying the book of Revelation is that then gets us into what we're going to talk about Wednesday night, because in Wednesday night's class, we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 21 and 22. This is the only time that I've given you in this class two full chapters to study, but that's what you need to do for Wednesday night, because with the end of chapter 20, Satan has been judged. He's been defeated. The wicked have been defeated. They've been cast into the lake of fire, the second death. Now in Revelation chapter 21, the focus is going to turn. It's now going to turn to God's people. What happens with them after the final judgment? So I do hope that you will have the opportunity to join us again Wednesday night as we finish up the book of Revelation. Last time I taught the book of Revelation uh, at North Beach, 
If my memory serves me correctly, we never got to do chapter 21 and 22 because we ran out of nights. We ran out of classes for the quarter. This time, barring any unforeseen circumstance between now and Wednesday night, we should actually finish the class and cover those two chapters. I do hope that you will join us again Wednesday night as we do that. All right. I have not seen any questions that have come through. So while I'm giving you just an opportunity to ask some questions, if you have some, I'm going to remind you of what we're going to be doing in just a little while here this evening. Uh, we have our 6 p.m. live stream. We're going to have a sermon. This is not a service. Uh, the service that we had, we had at 10 o'clock this morning, both live stream and in person. Tonight, though, at 6 p.m., we're going to have just a sermon. We're going to finish that series. We talked about, we talked two weeks ago about Holy Spirit baptism. We talked last week about the miraculous spiritual gifts. Tonight, we're going to speak very specifically about this idea of speaking in tongues and what the scriptures have to say about that. That's going to start at 6 p.m. However, not here on Facebook. If you want to listen to that, and I hope that you will, you'll need to go to livestream.com slash NBCOC. That's where the live stream will be. I will also say this. If you don't have time to uh, listen to that sermon this evening, uh, maybe it's getting late where you are. We've got some folks that are with us this evening that are in completely different time zones. Uh, maybe uh, we've got uh, some that are in different countries even. Um, and so you may not, it may be really late where you are. Um, the good thing about that live stream site is those files are archived there right there. So tomorrow, if you've got about 45 minutes, and you want to listen to that, you can just go over to that um, website and listen to that uh, sermon that we're going to be doing this evening. That's at 6 p.m. So it looks like I'm still not seeing any questions that have come through. So it looks like we got about 20 some odd minutes before we start the sermon. So that gives you an opportunity to, to take care of whatever you need to do and, and switch your uh, computer from Facebook over to livestream.com so that we can study from God's word this evening. Thank you all again very much for tuning in tonight as we've studied the book of Revelation chapter 20. If you've got some questions you think about later, uh, if you know how to reach out to me, um, send me a message and I'll look at that and try to answer that question for you. One way you can definitely reach out to me, if you're on Facebook right now, you go to the church's Facebook page, you can send us a message. That message goes straight to me. I'm the one that'll get that and the one who'll answer that and I'll try to answer your message uh, that you send to me. Thank you all very much again. Sorry for the sound issues at the beginning. One of these days, I hope that I'll get, a point, I'll get to a point where I actually remember to push all the right buttons at the right time to make everything work the way it's supposed to. Y'all have a good evening and I hope that you'll listen in here in about 20 minutes. Thank you again and good night.